Another October, another Top 13 video about another anthology series that first aired years before I was even born. This time, we're taking a look back at the 1980s revival of The Twilight Zone. While I certainly feel like I'm getting too old too fast, I am still too young to have actually watched this when it first aired on TV in the 80s, but I do have a certain nostalgia for it because I did happen upon reruns of it years ago on the Chiller channel. Not too long after I was first getting into the original, in fact. Even as a bit of a Twilight Zone newbie back then, I thought the 80s revival followed in the classic's footsteps pretty well, presenting us with many imaginative, thought-provoking, and sometimes creepy supernatural or sci-fi ideas that ultimately work in service of stories that are all too human, just like the best of the original. The format was a bit different, with the first and second seasons having hour-long episodes, each consisting of two or three different stories of varying length, and not all of them had that classic Rod Serling-esque narration at the opening and or closing. Nor does the narrator ever appear as an on-screen host like Serling, Whittaker, or Peel, which is certainly missed. But what's more important is that most of the actual stories are still totally in spirit with The Twilight Zone. The original had excellent storytellers like Rod Serling, Charles Beaumont, and Richard Matheson as its MVPs, and the movie had Steven Spielberg. But the creative forces behind the 80s series were nothing to sneeze at either. Harlan Ellison, Wes Craven, George R.R. R. Martin, Rockne O'Bannon, J. Michael Straczynski, and lots more awesome writers and directors all brought something special to this show. While it'll probably never be as iconic or widely beloved as the original series, much like the original, this series has gained a well-deserved following of its own over time, and I'm happy to spread more of the love today. For this Halloween season, I'm counting down my top 13 favorite episodes of the 1980s Twilight Zone. Number 13. The After Hours. You heard that title, right? This episode is a remake of the classic series episode of the same name. The 80s series had a few of these, from an enjoyable enough remake of Night of the Meek, to a remake of A Game of Pool that just leaves a baffling bad taste in your mouth by the end. Oddly, I don't recall ever seeing any of these remake episodes back when I was watching reruns on TV, but word of mouth did not exactly have me looking forward to them when I started marathoning the series again. So I was pleasantly surprised at just how much I enjoyed this one. It might have landed a little higher on my list if I had gone into it totally blind without ever having seen the original. But the fact is, I have, and while there are details that have been omitted, updated, or just done somewhat differently in this version, any classic series fans will already know the gist of where the story is gonna go. A young woman at a department store begs her way into a shop just as everyone is closing up for the night. She gets more and more creeped out by the awkward workers, all the bizarrely personal questions they ask her, and realizing just how little she really remembers about herself and her own life. A building sense of isolation in a large, dark, empty mall, living store mannequins closing in on her, and, of course, an ending twist ensue. I admit, the original After Hours still has a stronger sense of atmosphere that builds much more slowly and eerily, and being in black and white only enhances the mood. But I think it depends on which different approach to the creepy living mannequin premise you're in the mood for. In the remake, the highlight of the story is a chase scene, which may be a more conventional kind of horror climax, but it's a pretty good one that takes a bit more advantage of the visual nightmare fuel and body horror potential, which helps further set it apart from the original. This version also distinctly feels more oppressive and inescapable for the heroine. So even if you do already know what the twist is going to be, the presentation of it makes the ending more unsettling than how the original came across, at least to me. All in all, the classic version is classic for good reason, and probably still better in many ways, but I consider this alternative a good enough little horror piece on its own to earn it a spot among my personal favorites of this series. Also, the lead is a pre-Star Trek Deep Space Nine Terry Farrell, so that's pretty cool too. Number 12. Private Channel. This one isn't another remake, but you could say it has a superficially similar premise to the episode A Penny for Your Thoughts. However, while that was just an entertaining romp for the most part, 
The mysterious supernatural element in this story comes with a more serious lesson for its protagonist, who, as you can see, is quite possibly the most 80s main character in the entire 80s series. We meet this teen at an airport and see how he conducts himself on the way to his flight. He always has his headphones on, jamming to his tunes and being totally obnoxious and inconsiderate to the people around him. But mid-flight, a lightning strike by chance alters his cassette player, enabling him to hear not music, but the thoughts of the other passengers through his headphones. Until now, this guy's headset has tuned everyone else out, allowed him to strut around complacently in his own little world, ignoring what others might think or feel. But now it's given him a direct line to those thoughts and feelings. And that may be their one hope, as he hears the thoughts of one disgruntled passenger who's hiding a bomb. Our unlikely hero of course tries to warn the crew, but, well, who's gonna believe the punk teenager who's been making an ass of himself since before they even took off? It's a short, simple, and satisfying tale of a usually escapist piece of technology, reminding a self-centered, disaffected youth of our common humanity just when it's needed most. Also, the bomber in this episode is Andrew Robinson, who would later play another fan-favorite Deep Space Nine character. I swear I didn't plan to put these two episodes right next to each other because of that connection, it just kind of turned out that way. Number 11. Many, many monkeys. This one comes from the third, final, and in my opinion, weakest season. Most of the episodes in season 3 aren't bad per se, just generally not as interesting or memorable as what came before, save for a few gems like this one. The whole story takes place in a hospital as an outbreak of some unknown disease is making people spontaneously go blind. With no apparent common cause, doctors are baffled, but one patient offers an interesting possible explanation. She suggests that people are becoming monkeys, in the old see-no-evil, hear-no-evil, speak-no-evil way. That complacent, apathetic, self-centered people who figuratively turn a blind eye to other people's plight or any problems bigger than themselves, are now getting their comeuppance by losing their sight altogether. Claire, the main nurse we follow through the story, naturally doesn't take this superstitious notion seriously at first, but the longer the blindness epidemic goes on, the more patients keep flooding in and indeed, acting very selfish, uncaring, or downright hateful. And, despite their whole job ostensibly being about helping others, even some doctors and nurses aren't safe from this affliction. If this blindness really does stem from an overabundance of apathy and callousness in modern society, one is left to wonder if perhaps an eventual scientific treatment for their eyesight would only be temporarily treating the symptom and not the true epidemic. A pretty unique and intriguing idea for a story meant to make you reflect on the importance of empathy, our own individual responsibility for what we get when we don't exercise enough of that empathy, and how the minutia and stresses of day-to-day -day life can make it very easy for people to become numb to the feelings and needs of others, while regularly justifying it to themselves without a second thought, like, oh well, it's not my problem, or there's nothing I can do, I don't make the rules here, or I'm the one who's really got a problem, where's all my sympathy? Even though these attitudes aren't going to magically make you go blind in real life, probably, the real point about compassion and responsibility versus convenience and excuses still really can apply to all kinds of social situations and is good food for thought. Oh, and I know everybody mentions this, but yeah, the script for this one was actually intended for the original Twilight Zone series, but the network passed on it for being quote-unquote too grotesque. I don't know if they meant it was going to be too visually or implicitly disturbing to the sensibilities of audiences back then, but hell, even if they thought it was grotesque in both ways, that audience already handled all kinds of visually and implicitly dark, uncomfortable ideas. The human race being systematically turned into livestock for towering, vacant-faced aliens to eat? Suspicion and panic driving a formerly picturesque American neighborhood to turn on and chaotically murder each other? and freaky pig faces being the standard for beauty in a segregated dystopian society. I think they could have handled this story had it been in the original. But that's just my opinion. In any case, it is nice to know that a story that was originally rejected not only did eventually get to see the light of day, but it also proved to be a compelling standout of the 80s series. Number 10. 
A Little Peace and Quiet. This is the second of the two stories in the series premiere, and as much as I like the first story, Shatterday, I enjoy this one more, partly because it's just a lot more fun to watch, and because of that unforgettable ending. A devoted but stressed housewife with a hectic home life is just about at her wit's end. Wild, noisy kids, a dopey, preoccupied husband, shitloads of other day-to-day -day responsibilities piling up, and just an all-around seriously overworked and underappreciated existence. But one day, she finds a mysterious medallion that allows her to freeze or unfreeze time on a whim, giving her all the calming alone time she could ever need, whenever she needs it, and letting her essentially skip over and or rearrange all of those tedious parts of adult life. Waiting in line for what feels like forever at the grocery store, dealing with family squabbles where everyone is hollering over each other and expecting mom to take care of everything, humoring door-to-door -door people who are selling or preaching something you don't really care about, etc. After seeing this poor woman's home life, you do really feel the relief and sense of fun when she suddenly has the ability to pause and mute all this stuff and do everything at her own comfortable pace. It also helps that she's pretty easy to like, with how patient and loving she must be to have put up with this family as long as she did before ever getting the time medallion, and even when using its power at a grocery store, she still has the integrity to pay when she could have just been in and out of there without anyone noticing anything. But when you literally have all the time in the world like this, you might start to take it for granted, become all the more inclined to ignore those inconvenient moments like you have no time for them at all, and let's just say that can wind up leaving you with some regrets. In this case, A Little Peace and Quiet closes on a thoroughly disquieting note that I can see coming off as a jarring tone shift, but the setup throughout is actually just as easy for first-time viewers to not pay attention to as it is for the protagonist. Pretty clever. This is by no means the only Twilight Zone story that essentially says be careful what you wish for at the end, but it's one that chillingly sticks with you like no other. Number 9 a message from Charity. We have a teenage boy named Peter from the 1980s and a teenage girl named Charity from the 1700s, both falling ill and seeing confusing bits and pieces of each other's worlds. But even as they both recover from their illness and get back to their lives, they find that not only were those strange visions not delirious hallucinations, but somehow they can directly speak to one another and see through each other's eyes from across time. It's a bizarre telepathic connection that neither of them can explain, but they decide to just roll with it, and soon form a very special bond as they get to know each other and their respective worlds. Charity is able to experience the future and all its wondrous advances through Peter, like tasting a wider variety of foods than she ever dreamed of, flying far above the ground in an airplane, and having access to huge public libraries when she's only been able to read a small handful of books herself. Their connection gives her an awe-inspiring and fun escape from her repressed, simpler life, and it gives Peter his first truly close friend after being a socially awkward loner for most of his life. But things get complicated when Charity tells her neighbors a bit too much about what she's seen from the future. Things that are suspicious, outrageous, and potentially punishable by death where and when she's from. See, as Peter soon realizes, that particular where and when is Puritan Salem, Massachusetts. Do it! With Charity accused of witchcraft, she and Peter must work together with the resources and information they have in the past and future to devise a way to save her from execution. This is a sweet-as-hell story of first love, a clever, unique kind of time travel story where nobody actually physically travels in time, and occasionally an interesting look at how the more things change, the more they stay the same. You live in a savage age, Charity. Aye. Tis fortunate we have not invented the bomb. Ho ho! Now that was savage! Both lead characters are very likable. Their friendship transcending the different cultures and upbringings is endearing and convincing, despite them obviously never being able to share any in-person chemistry. And ultimately, how they both personally grow from having known each other the way they did is pretty damn heartwarming. By the way, Peter is Robert Duncan McNeil, and Charity's father is James Cromwell, both of whom have also been in Star Trek. In more than one role each, in fact. 
I should probably just stop bringing up Star Trek actors, or else it's gonna be Easter by the time this Halloween video is over. Next. Number 8. Paladin of the Lost Hour. An elderly man named Gasper is attacked by muggers while visiting his wife's grave. During the scuffle, when one tries to take his pocket watch, it somehow burns him and levitates back to its owner. A young man named Billy, not seeing that particular part of the altercation, steps in and scares the crooks off. He invites Gasper to rest at his apartment for a little while, but allows him to stay longer when they become fast friends, and it becomes apparent that the poor old man is actually homeless and dying soon. Billy is a fairly average Joe just trying to get by in current society as it is, while Gasper is more eccentric and vocal about how much better the average Joe can do to improve society, even with something as small as one person avoiding littering. One is young, strong, and would rather hang his head and avoid trouble. The other is old, withering, and can physically afford even less trouble, but doing what's right anyway is worth it to him. They make an unusual pair, but the more they talk and hang out, the more they genuinely connect and gradually open up to one another about their respective old wounds. Namely, Gasper's grief over his late beloved wife, and Billy's war trauma and survivor's guilt over his time fighting in Vietnam. No joke, the scene where Billy relives the horrors he went through in the war, describing it all in painful detail, laying bare all the emotional torment he's wrestled with every day since and breaks down, is one of the most palpable, gut-wrenching, and phenomenally acted moments in any Twilight Zone story ever. Watch this episode for that scene alone, if nothing else. As Gasper's time draws near, that mysterious watch from earlier, the revelation of its true purpose, and the special duty its owner must bear for life, all might just hold the key to the closure and transitioning forward that both of these burdened men dearly need. Despite how iconic the Twilight Zone is for sci-fi, fantasy, and occasionally horror premises, it's also no stranger to more down-to-earth, emotional stories where the supernatural element present takes a backseat to strong character work and drama. And suffice to say, in any incarnation of the Twilight Zone, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more mature and poignant tale of friendship and the mutual healing that can occur between two weary souls who are lucky enough to find each other. Number 7. Shelter Skelter. This one is about a paranoid survivalist who is super fixated on preparing for nuclear war. He's built a fallout shelter under the house, stocked with all the supplies his family will need after the bombs go off. His obsession has him spending nearly all of his free time down there, training his very young son to handle guns, and being a jerk-ass man-of-the-house type who blatantly favors his son over his daughter and answers his wife's legitimate concerns about his behavior with condescending dismissal confident that he knows better than her or anyone else, and insists that everything he does will be for the family's own good in the end. But it isn't until his gun-selling friend comes over and they start chatting that we really start to see his preparation for the end of society is not just about protecting his family. He actually can't wait for nuclear devastation. He revels in how countless people will die horribly when the bombs drop, how much better off, purified he thinks humanity will be when all those soft, immoral, expendable degenerates are wiped out, leaving only red-blooded militant survivors like him to inherit the Earth. Then, of course, a nuclear blast actually occurs, and the man and his friend are trapped together in the shelter. They're stuck down there for months with no radio or any means of contacting any survivors outside. And over those months, our heroes' radical, self-aggrandizing, and cruel attitudes have just gotten worse and worse, hurling abuse at his friend and still ranting and raving about his better world, survival of the fittest, yada yada yada, until even the friend has had all he can stomach and would rather take his chances outside, despite how the radiation levels still strangely haven't gone down after all this time. This story is emblematic of the time it was made in, with the Cold War going on and all the real-life paranoia about nuclear annihilation, but it's also a kind of commentary that's still relevant today. In particular, how ugly and delusional too much machismo and doggy-dog -dog mentality can make somebody, especially when they personally extol them above all else like this guy does. It's quite fitting that in the end, he's still convinced that he is the ideal survivor, self-sufficient and will come out on top eventually, blind to how alone, self-defeating, and utterly powerless he really is now.
confined to a metaphorical and literal prison of his own making. And if it sounds like I've spoiled the entire episode from start to finish, trust me, I haven't quite. Number 6. Profile in Silver We meet Dr. Fitzgerald, a Harvard professor who turns out to be from centuries in the future, and his real job as a field historian is to travel back in time, live under a fake identity in the designated time period, and record important historical events firsthand. In this case, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. This would already be a solemn enough mission for anyone, but is made all the more so by the fact that the good doctor is not only a lifelong admirer, but actually a direct descendant of Kennedy. While he's naturally not looking forward to it, he does initially seem to have every intention of putting his personal feelings aside, doing his job by the book, and watching the big moment play out according to history. However, when that big moment comes, he just can't help himself and cries out for the president to duck, saving his life just in time. And for a little while, everything seems to be looking up thanks to our time traveler's knee-jerk intervention. Nobody was killed, he's a national hero, he gets to go to the White House as a guest and actually meet his ancestor in person, and they get along every bit as well as he ever could have dreamed. Unfortunately, as he looks ahead at how history will play out now that the assassination never occurred, Fitzgerald discovers that his actions have severely damaged the timeline. With domino effects being the unpredictable, indifferent bitches that they are, even a well-intentioned change to history, like saving someone whose life was tragically cut short, can still inadvertently alter the course of events for the worse. In this case, worldwide nuclear war worse. The episode title refers to a 1964 half-dollar coin Fitzgerald always carries on him, and that Kennedy's guard got a hold of. Being that it's still 1963, and a piece of US currency with a still-living president's face on it shouldn't exist, it's actually not too long before Kennedy himself is convinced of who his guest really is, brought up to speed on the dilemma they find themselves in, and faced with the sacrifice that may be required to set history right. Twilight Zone plus time travel tends to be a winning recipe, and this is no exception. It's always fascinating to see what-if scenarios where certain fateful events went differently and what consequences there might be, especially when there are unforeseen repercussions from time travelers meddling with history hoping to make a positive difference only to create whole new problems. And here, the ethical quandaries are all the tougher due to how personal the whole situation is for our hero. It was his mistake, and this man is his own relative, a major historical figure whom he reveres, and just a guy who deserves to live a full life as much as anyone else, but for the greater good of the timeline, it seems he can't. Andrew Robinson is here once again, and he delivers a terrific performance that not only matches the real JFK uncannily, but really endears you and makes you all the more hopeful that they'll find some way around his supposed destiny. Smart, gripping, and arguably ballsy for surrounding a very serious real-life event that had only happened a couple decades before this originally aired, but I think they went about it with a good deal of respect and came out with something special. Ask not what this episode can do for you, ask what you can do for this episode. Which is, you know, watching it, obviously. Number 5. Grandma. This is a Cthulhu Mythos story in the Twilight Zone with a teleplay by Harlan Ellison based on a short story by Stephen King. Oh, I am all over this episode. It focuses on a little boy named Georgie. No relation. But I'll let you decide which Georgie from a Stephen King story had it worse in the end. Anyway, Georgie is stuck at home for a few hours while his mom is away, and he's left to care for his grandmother. His creepy, creepy grandmother, who is cripplingly obese, supposedly senile, always bedridden and secluded in her room at the end of the long, dark hallway, where she makes disgusting, practically inhuman sounds, and has a very mysterious and frightening history. According to what Georgie has heard from his mom and other relatives, Strange, gruesome, downright unnatural horrors have befallen neighbors over the years, and usually just when something went improbably right for Grandma. This woman's own adult sons and daughters are afraid of her, only daring to argue about her in hushed whispers. So imagine being a kid having to attend to her all alone on a dark, stormy evening. 
Now imagine, on top of that, finding what the kid finds under the floorboards of her room. An obscure little tome you've probably never heard of called the Necronomicon. Yep, his grandmother is totally a witch. A witch who's had dark dealings with some nigh unspeakable forces. Forces that apparently don't want Georgie using the phone or leaving the house, as it just happens to get even stormier outside, leaving him stranded here with his dear old grandma. I pretty much always love creepier Twilight Zone episodes, but even as those episodes go, this one honestly feels more like something from an actual horror-centric anthology like Night Gallery or Tales from the Dark Side. There's a sinister atmosphere in this house, and how the shots are composed and lit really help you feel as anxious and trapped as this kid does. I especially love the shadowy, ominous hallway shots that convey how, for this kid, going anywhere near this infamous woman's room feels like walking barefoot into some mysterious underworld. My only real problem with this episode that I feel I should mention is how Georgie's inner monologue will not shut the fuck up. We spend so much of the runtime listening to his every last thought. Wow! Grandma's a witch! That's dumb! No, it ain't. Certainly is! And it sometimes undermines moments that would have been spookier and tenser if they were played silent. And a lot of what he's thinking or feeling about any given moment can easily be inferred through film language anyway. I get the purpose of it, hearing what the protagonist is thinking and what he remembers hearing people say about his scary grandmother helps provide useful exposition about her, and helps get across a bit more personality for Georgie, both of which are harder to accomplish when your protag is essentially alone for the whole story with nobody else to bounce off of. It's just that a good chunk of it feels unnecessary, and I can totally see the overused inner monologue aspect completely ruining this one for some viewers. But despite my complaining, it's not a deal-breaker for me in the end. The way it's shot, the atmosphere, sense of dread, the horrific reveal of Grandma near the end, there's just too much about it that still makes it a real standout, scary good time that I just couldn't put any lower on my list. And especially for a Twilight Zone episode, the ending is uncommonly amoral and ambiguous on a number of levels, but quite memorably chilling no matter how you choose to interpret it. Number 4. Eye of Newton. You know, most of these episodes have been pretty serious, so how about a shorter, sweeter tale that mostly just has fun with itself? This one is only about 8 minutes long and focuses on a college professor struggling to solve an advanced equation on his blackboard. He becomes so frustrated that he declares he would sell his soul just to get it right. And... Well, that can be arranged. What do you know, a real demon promptly appears in the room, ready to finalize the deal our professor carelessly just got himself into. And he can't seem to get himself out of it, despite trying to take back his remark, talk his way out of it, or just run. But that's not fair! Of course it's not fair. We're evil. Look it up. However, there are apparently some rules the demon is bound by. He has to let the professor ask three questions about the unfathomable feats that demons are capable of, and then he must either ask a question the demon can't answer, or demand a task the demon can't fulfill. And only by besting the demon in this challenge can he break free of the deal. Time to put that big brain of yours to the test like never before, professor. Comedic Twilight Zone stories can be pretty hit or miss, but this one is a real delight with a tone that's wry, quirky, and just genuinely tense enough to make it a unique and gripping take on your classic deal with the devil story. The demon has this casual, confident, shady salesman demeanor, while still leaving no doubt how unfathomably powerful and dangerous he can really be. A portrayal that both feels like a very 80s-style subversion, while also fitting right in with the kinds of devils we saw in the original Twilight Zone. I gotta say, as a non-religious misanthrope with a morbid sense of humor, I do get kind of a cynical kick out of how dealing with souls actually works according to this demon. How what us puny mortals value or think we deserve in life actually has fuck all to do with our fate, even with souls, demons, afterlives, etc. all turning out to be real. Hell isn't so concerned with punishing people who lived wicked lives, or recruiting soldiers for war against heaven or whatever. But rather, it's just another impersonal bureaucratic business. 
the demon viewing this poor guy's soul as just another commodity for his bosses to sell off to the highest bidding cosmic beings to do whatever they feel like with it. I find the literally soul-crushing implications of this system even funnier than this already funny episode probably ever intended. But just in case you're one of those normies that does have a grain of hope in their heart, rest assured, our professor does come up with a solution that's more devilishly clever than even this literal devil was prepared for. And it is just plain awesome. Kids, never underestimate the value of information and the power of critical thinking skills. You never know when they might come in handy against supposedly all-powerful extra-dimensional entities with terrible haircuts and t-shirts that constantly change text. Number 3. Dealer's Choice Hi Morgan Freeman before you were a household name. What? I said I was done pointing out Star Trek alumni. I made no promises about other actors I like. I would not be the first person to highly recommend this episode to fans of the classic Twilight Zone who are on the fence about getting into the 80s series. It really does recreate the kind of simple yet inspired hook, the sense of humor, and the clever writing that a great original series story would have. Five friends are enjoying one of their regular poker nights, having a few beers, joking around, bitching about their wives, the usual. But every party needs a pooper, and they soon discover that one of them is actually the devil here to take one of their souls, and insisting that there's nothing they can do to stop him. Except, hey, since they're already playing poker and the devil is in a sporting mood, it's agreed that if the friends can beat him in a winner-take-all card game, he'll back off. Of course, as another denizen of hell so helpfully reminded us a moment ago, Evil, remember? You can't seriously expect the devil to play fair, and these guys had better keep that in mind if they want to make it through this poker night with all their souls. Again, this episode has a great sense of humor about itself, with everyone naturally intimidated by the heavy situation they're in, but once it's settled in, they actually act pretty casual and amiable about it, often to quite funny effect. But what's the devil doing here in New Jersey? What are you talking about, Tony? I think he lives here. All right, but well, what's he doing here in this house? Yes. Oh, oh man. Give us a break, will you? It's one thing being a devil, it's another thing being a total jerk. What's going on? Uh, Nick's the devil and Peter's playing him. Uh, how much? 19 bucks. And yeah, come to think of it, if I suddenly found myself caught up in a life or death predicament with a real live devil, I'd also probably save the theological existential implications for later, and just focus on solving the problem at hand like our heroes do here. Of all the episodes I saw on TV, this is the one I remembered most after all these years. The one where some guys play cards with the devil. Hard to forget. Considering that, and how high I ended up putting it on the list, you'd think I would have more to say about it, more to delve into, but not really. It's pretty simple. And I think that's one of its biggest strengths. Sometimes all you really need is a simple premise, a fun script, and entertaining actors with chemistry, and you can deliver one of the most solid and fun highlights of a series. Dealer's Choice is a wonderful testament to that. If you're not sure if you would enjoy the 80s series, I say go all in with this episode if no other. Of course, if you're counting, there are still two more that I personally love even more than this one. Number 2. To See the Invisible Man This one takes place in a totalitarian future where it's a crime for citizens to show a significant lack of regard for others and they can be sentenced to a unique form of exile from society. Our protag is given a marking, which to me always looks like a chewed-up wad of bubblegum on his forehead, but to everyone else in this society means he is to be treated as invisible at all times. For an entire year, he must live essentially alone in plain sight, where nobody is allowed to speak to him, look at him, or acknowledge his presence in any way. Which actually sounds pretty fun at first, since he's a self-interested jerk who was never a people person to begin with. What's not to like? Now he's free to do pretty much anything, with everybody legally bound to just pretend they don't see him skipping to the front of a line, taking whatever stuff he wants, strolling right into any exclusive place he wants, including a ladies-only steam room, etc. However, the novelty and enjoyability wears off a lot quicker than he expected as no matter how self-centered or antisocial a person may be, sooner or later, everybody needs to be seen, to connect, to be part of something outside themselves. For a person to be mentally and emotionally healthy, they need stimulation, communication, validation, 
all sorts of other things that probably end with Asian, and that you can only fulfillingly get through personal interaction. An entire year of this kind of isolation is arguably a crueler punishment than the solitary confinement we have in real prisons. Our invisible man can roam freely and is surrounded by other people, but even though he's not really invisible and any of them technically could interact with him, the dystopian law monitoring everything ensures they won't. Just halfway through his sentence, we clearly see the emptiness and despair of living like this are already taking their toll on him. But no matter how sorry he is for his previous behavior, no matter how desperately he begs for somebody to just look at him for a moment, hell, even when he's injured and needs help, society continues to steadfastly ignore him until the day his sentence is up. It's honestly tough to watch at times, not just because we see he is learning his lesson and will try to be a better person, but also because it's so easy for anyone who's ever been ignored, excluded, or dehumanized to feel just as dejected and beaten down as he does the longer he goes through this grueling year. Other episodes on this list have similarly dealt with empathy and humanity, using their own unique and thought-provoking Twilight zone -y twists, but I consider this one to be the most grounded and emotionally impactful episode of its kind, as well as the one that especially gets to me personally. I may or may not know a thing or two about being a bitter, curmudgeonly outsider who's quick to say they hate interacting with people and prefer to be alone, until they've been alone long enough for the weight of genuine loneliness and all that comes with it to settle in, and they're left feeling just kind of... yeah. <laughs> it's just like my life! <laughs> in a way! But in case I've made it sound like this episode is just a depressing, kinda of fucked up tale that ultimately vindicates a cruel and authoritarian system because our hero does become a more empathetic person, just like his punishment was always supposed to do, well, don't worry. The story ends on a perfect, beautifully moving note that affirms what real empathy is all about, and that when a person truly has learned it firsthand, it's not something that any law can ever truly mandate or define limits to. To See the Invisible Man is a poignant episode that I'm happy to see again anytime. Before we get to number one, as with any list of this kind, there are plenty of other good episodes that I would also consider favorites and totally recommend, so here are a few of my runner-ups. Starting with some additional creepy ones, because I feel kind of awkward calling this a Halloween video, when I only ended up putting like two of the scarier episodes on my main list. Number 1. One Life Furnished in Early Poverty This episode involves a writer with inner demons, a child-beating father, a misfit boy getting bullied, and a vague supernatural element that makes the whole story possible. And given all that, the biggest twist of this episode is it's not based on another Stephen King story. No, it's actually another Harlan Ellison story. The story that he put the most of his own life into, according to Ellison himself on the DVD commentary. Apparently this adaptation had a profoundly emotional effect on him too, and it's not hard to see why. It's about a screenwriter named Gus, whose successful career doesn't seem to have actually fulfilled him much personally. Lately he's been very irritable, jaded, and weighed down by unresolved issues from his past. Gus feels drawn back to his hometown, and once he's there, he mysteriously seems to have gone back in time to the days of his childhood, back when the other kids would beat on him just for being an easy target from a lower-class family, and his father would give him the fucking belt whenever he got in trouble. Gus is able to witness some of the harshest, most vulnerable parts of his past from the perspective of the adult who's lived with it for decades, and now he has an opportunity to intervene in his own history. He decides to befriend his past self in hopes of sparing him some of the hardship he remembers and providing some of the understanding and support he always wished somebody had given him back then. I would hardly be the first to note that this episode feels sort of like a spiritual successor to Walking Distance, 
a classic series episode that was also about a weary grown man traveling back to his past and also taking some very different life lessons from the experience in the end than he expected. But they're pretty different too. While I certainly like Walking Distance as a good episode, I personally relate a lot more to this episode's take on a person revisiting his childhood and find it a richer, more powerful story all around. For the record, no, I was never beaten as a standard form of punishment like Gus was, and I know damn well that loads of people out there have had or are having way worse childhoods than I did. I'm just saying I rarely ever look back on my developmental years through lenses anywhere near as rose-tinted as the walking distance guy had. This isn't about a man who's wistful for his good old days who realizes he was blinded by nostalgia, but a tale of a man who's been holding on to anger and regrets most of his life, and is now seeking to change parts of his history for the better, like I'm sure we've all occasionally imagined doing if we could go back in time. I definitely do that a lot more than I should, and that's partly why this story resonates with me a lot more. The beauty is, in the process of trying to change things for Kid Gus, his time in the past actually does more to change adult Gus for the better. He gets reacquainted with an innocent, fun-loving side of himself that he sadly lost sight of over the years, in his determination to make it big and stick it to everyone who ever put him down. He gets one last chance to have a genuine man-to-man -man talk with his deceased father the way he never could while he was still alive, and in doing so gains some closure and a newfound appreciation for his father's point of view. Not necessarily excusing how he treated his son, but reminding them both that he was as much a product of his own environment and deep-seated issues as Gus is now. And by the end, the experience teaches him a lesson that just about anyone looking back on their past, rough childhood or not, can find some real value in. That as easy as they are to dwell on or resent, the most painful, disappointing, angry chapters of our lives are always part of us, and that can turn out to be just as much for good as for ill. What's important in the end is how we let them shape who we are, and sometimes it takes a hard, honest look at your old wounds from a new perspective to begin moving forward in earnest. One life furnished in early poverty is a somber, layered, bittersweet gem of a character piece that sticks with the viewer in the end like only the best Twilight Zone stories do, and it's my personal number one favorite episode of the 1980s series. Well, those were my top 13 favorites from the first revival of the greatest anthology series in TV history. In my opinion, the 80s series not only still holds up pretty damn well on its own, but now that a couple more revival attempts have come and gone, I think it still remains the second best Twilight Zone show. Sure, it has a few duds here and there, but very few shows don't. When it's good, it's good. When it's great, it's absolutely Twilight Zone great. You can just feel as you're watching that it was made by very talented creators who love the Rod Serling classic as much as we all do, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you give it a watch. For those of you who have already watched, what are your favorite episodes? Let me know in the comments. And so ends this year's spooky season video. I hope you all enjoyed it, happy Halloween, and maybe, just maybe, I'll get off my ass and make my next video sooner than next October. After all, there's always plenty more film and TV to talk about. Countless more compelling, imaginative, chilling, or just plain fun pieces of genre fiction that can always be found both in and out of the Twilight Zone.